We made it. We're right at the end. Did everybody have a good time? This is my uh, first RubyConf. I'd been going to RailsConf uh, for a few years, but I just am so excited at how many people I got to meet and just the camaraderie here. I just, uh, this is going to be a mainstay for me. I'm, I'm really excited that uh, you guys actually stuck it out. You're, you're going to our, my talk, and I, I'm really excited because this is a really important topic to me. So my talk is entitled Dishonest Software, Fighting Back Against Industry Norms. My name is Jason Meller. I'm a reformed script kitty. In practice, that means uh, I, maybe when I was 13, I liked to call myself a hacker, but really I was just downloading stuff off the internet and breaking things. Uh, I found out later that that didn't feel so good, and uh, I ended up really starting my uh, cybersecurity uh, career right after college. Uh, but I'm also uh, a Ruby developer, specifically Rails apps. I have probably bought, brought Ruby on Rails to every single cybersecurity company that I've ever worked for, and uh, I founded my own company, Collide. Collide is a security app for devices, and our whole philosophy is instead of locking down a device and preventing people from using them, it messages you guys, the employees, on Slack when your device has a security or policy issue. So we try to actually take this user-focused approach, try to be honest about it, and we try to fix the problems that can't be actually fixed with automated remediation alone. It's really about forming a relationship with the end user. So as you can ima imagine, honesty is a huge component of that. In fact, it's so huge, um, I authored a mini book guide called honest.security. That's the full URL. It's kind of sad, actually, that that URL was available for us to register. <laughs> it says something about the industry that I'm in today, and uh, I'm hoping that this talk we can really talk about the differences between honest software versus legal software and things that you can take back with you to your workplaces to advocate for honesty in the things that we're building and using on a regular basis. I contend, you know, there's cynics out there that maybe not, don't agree with this, but I don't think most people in this room ever intended or wanted to benefit from dishonest software. But in fact, I think that many of us already have or will. I'm going to tell a really personal story that changed my whole perspective on this. And um, it will sort of highlight why uh, I feel this way. So we're not going to be really be talking about classic dishonest software like malware, viruses, things that are inherently evil just by looking at them. We're going to be talking about how I, someone who thought they were a good person, fell victim to building and purporting and creating dishonest software. So it starts off at my first job at General Electric. I uh, graduated from college. I went into their management program. I was really proud. And I quickly found myself on their security team called the GE Computer Incident Response Team. Now, this was sort of an exciting time for the security team at GE because we were battling something known as the Advanced Persistent Threat, abbreviated as APT. So APT, it's a term that the security industry has now taken and turned into sort of this marketing buzzword, but it specifically refers to uh -um, the Chinese government and them actually sponsoring threat actors. These threat actors, they wage a long-running and extensive cybersecurity espionage campaign against Western interests, specifically companies in the Fortune 500. Now, they have one mission. That mission is to exfiltrate steal valuable information that will advance the Chinese military and economic interests. This is mostly proprietary IP. So this wasn't this abstract concept or when you read about viruses online. These are real people. We actually could see where they worked out of. This is uh, their actual location in Beijing. This is that same building. Advance the slide. And this is the People Liberation Army, Unit 61398. This is that same building, now off to the side, and we can now see guards outside the front. These are the people that were actually attacking the company looking to exfiltrate data. 
You might be saying, Jason, you know, what are the value are they really getting? You know, what's the worst that could happen? What, the Chinese are going to be able to figure out a way to make a terrible dishwasher? Like, what's really at stake here? You know, what does GE really make that's, uh, that's super important to defend? Well, the G GE isn't just about appliances. They are a Department of Defense contractor. And back in the late 90s, uh, they were awarded this uh, Joint Strike fi Fighter engine contract by the Department of Defense. And their portion of it was to build this uh, relatively innovative engine. It was an advanced turbo frame engine uh, used in many of the aircraft that were going to be part of this program. This program was to build the next generation of aircraft for most Western militaries uh, that would defend their, their interests and, and you provide an additional military capacity. So this is a big deal. So you can imagine if they're able to get their hands on the schematics for this thing, they can determine things like how long will this thing remain in the air without fuel, you know, between refuelings? How long can I last in a dogfight against something that has this engine? Like that's really good, you know, intel that the Chinese government probably wants to have. And so they're going to go after the, not the Department of Defense, but the companies that are building the parts. And GE was one of them. Really scary. So how does the APT work? Well, they work by actually staging up all of the stuff that they want to seal um, in just arbitrary servers that they've already compromised. So they start off, they do like a phishing campaign, they trick someone into installing some malware, then they get persistence on the device, they start spreading to other devices, they start collecting credentials, and they start infecting more and more and more things. They start finding the things that they want to exfiltrate out, and then they start bundling them up. They bundle them up on servers, and uh, then once they've done that, they use just FTP to send it off to you know, a, probably like a, a VPS host, something that wouldn't raise any alarms, something that you could buy an account for cheap using maybe a prepaid card. And that's how, and then they eventually funnel it all the way back to China, you know, some server that's physically in China. Uh, they actually use RAR, uh, the RAR uh, archive format instead of zip. And it's actually really clever because if you get, uh, you can actually chunk RAR files, you might remember that from, from years ago when they were more popular. And in fact, if you're missing some of the chunks or one transmission gets interrupted midway through, you can actually still preserve and pull out some of the files, unlike some of the other uh, cabinet formats that are out there. So they were smart. They thought this through. And uh, they had a whole modus operandi that we were looking for. So now let's pivot over to what is our job as the GE cert. We want to be able to detect this in, this, these inf these, uh, this activity and you know, eventually maybe be in a position to stop it in real time. So to do this, back in 2010, we built this massive detection apparatus. This involved putting up you know, network taps in all the data centers, known egress points, the VPN concentrators. We were funneling all traffic that was really being generated by every employee in the organization, and we were mirroring it, we were scanning it, and we were saving it. Uh, we used a format called PCAP, and that's something that allows us to actually look at every single part of the packet that we're capturing. And remember, this is in 2010. This is before there was even 5% penetration of HTTPS. That means we could see everything in the clear like for every employee. And this is what it looked like for us. You know, we would open up a tool called Wireshark when we were looking at PCAP. And there's a web request right there. The red is the response. The blue is the reply. And we could see it historically going forward. There was a timeline. And so essentially with this, and as you can imagine, because everything was unencrypted, we could know anything that we wanted really about a person. How could this be legal? Well, in the United States, this is perfectly legal. It still is legal today. Uh, there is a law that was passed in the mid-'80s called the Electronic Communication Privacy Act. Like many laws that are out there today, it sounds the intent of it was to actually define rules of engagement for how to stop wiretapping and prevent it. But like most laws, it kind of did the opposite. It carved out a massive exception for businesses because politicians and lawmakers felt they had the right to really monitor assets that they had purchased. And that created this massive carve out that they were able to use to legally justify a lot of this type of surveillance. So this law actually allows you to do things that I didn't even know were true until um, uh, you know, back then. 
Uh, if you get physical mail delivered to an office that's in your name, they can open it right up. That's not a felony in that context. Um, a lot of folks, you know, you imagine, oh, I'm being tracked via GPS. Think of like truckers and things like that where they really need to do that. No, they're allowed to do that on any device they control. And even if it happens to be devices that are in your pocket or in your backpack, they have the right and effectively can track you. They can record keystrokes, take screenshots, and save network traffic on company uh, for any company device. So how far can they go? Well, um, recently, uh, this was challenged in court. Uh, they can't remote activate your webcam or microphone without prior consent every single time they do it. In fact, this was challenged uh, by a school, uh, by parents at, and students that worked at a school district or went to a school district. The school district had this remote you know, security software. They provisioned it on all the students' devices when they were going home. They were just popping open the webcam and watching what the students were doing. And uh, they actually tried to mount the defense that that was fine and covered under this act. And the judge obviously you know, punished them and they had to settle out of court. So not everything is perfectly legal, but a lot of things are. So, so it's legal, but we're good guys and we need to rationalize it beyond that. And so how did we rationalize this at GE? Well, we felt our mission was pure. We're Americans, this is patriotic. We are fighting a foreign enemy and we are saving the country. Like GE is building a military capability for the United States. This is China. This is someone who isn't necessarily our ally. We feel like this is worth it. And the thing is like, yeah, we could see everything that you were doing, but these were, we're looking for sophisticated heists. We're, we don't care if you're like, you know, browsing Facebook or worse. You know, we have bigger fish to fry, so you don't have to worry. And we know ourselves, we're good people, and we've been vetted. You know, some of us had secret clearance, top secret clearance from the FBI. And of course, we had, you know, one or two folks that were in charge of auditing our own activities, so we've got that covered. And yeah, there's psychic costs to surveillance. But, you know, I don't think most people are going to really know that they're being surveilled. It's not like they can see it's happening on the network. And if we can stop this from happening, that could save someone's life in the future. And that is really measurable, pure harm that we're stopping. The psychic cost, we can't measure that. So it just feels like the right trade-off. So we implemented this. It ran for many, many months. And then on one dark and stormy night, it happened. We got an alert. And it was exactly what we thought we would see. It was someone staging up RAR files on a server, and they were starting the process of transferring them to an FPC, FTP server. And they did everything just like we expected. They encrypted them. They chunked them out into 200 megabyte partitions. And they were using the VPS host that we had heard or saw in prior experiences uh, that, we, that they had used in the past. We've got them. And here's the kicker. We are seeing it happen live in real time. This is a first. And now we're in a very interesting position because we can stop it. And that's exactly what we did. We went onto the staging server that they had compromised and we immediately deleted all the RAR files that they had staged up. We then cut off the FTP transmission, blocked all the, you know, the, the IP addresses so they couldn't re reinitiate it. But we didn't want to stop there. There was something else that we could do to go above and beyond that set of remediation. And that was, can we log into their FTP server? Because we can see the password, right? It's all clear text. And delete the files that they had already gotten across the wire, hack back. We called up the GE executives. This went all the way to the top. And they said, do it. And we did. And we were pumped. We were so excited, we were slapping each other on the back, and we had just totally stopped a real-time you know, exfiltration event you know, by a Chinese state-sponsored actor, and we were the heroes of GE. A couple days later, we learned something interesting. We hadn't stopped anything at all. In fact, what we thought was APT activity was just a simple contractor backing up their personal photos to their own FTP site. And they just happened to use a RAR file 
and they happened to do it in a way that resembled the activity that we were looking for. What happened? The scrutiny that this contrast suddenly had on them from executives at a Fortune 5 company was too much. The contractor provider, their boss, fired them just because they were, yeah, they did something maybe that wasn't quite on the up and up, but it was not really a big deal. Fired them. And on top of that, it was their personal photos going all the way back to you know, inception. We had deleted every single piece of, you know, of, of personal family photos that they had ever taken because that was their backup that they were transferring over from a prior loss. Word spread throughout GE that this had happened and our reputation was tarnished and people were afraid of what we would do next. I was terrified to go back into work. I was the junior person on the team. I felt terrible. There were no tangible consequences for me or my peers, even though we had totally bungled this. And uh, at the end of the day, the credibility that we lost in the organization caused people not to trust us. And I firmly believe it negatively impacted the overall security of the company, despite the fact that we were never officially admonished. Rough. This stuck with me. Trust us, we are the good guys. It's not honest. What is honest is trust us because you can independently verify we are telling the truth. And there is a difference there. So at Collide, this is how we approach this. You have the right to know what we can see at Collide. We give every single end user, not the people who are buying the software, the people who are affected by the software, a pure roadmap on what the company is looking for, why they're looking for it, and what privacy impact that may have on them so they know exactly what to expect. And they can see this information before they decide to opt in. Why is this important to do? When you build on a software, you can create new relationships that weren't there before. As I mentioned earlier, our whole product is about messaging people on Slack because we can get them to solve problems on their computer that can't be automated. One of those things that we have is finding unencrypted SSH keys on developer machines. There's no automatic remediation for that. We have to have the developer set a passcode. So if we want to send them a message to have them do that, they need to know why they're getting the message and how our system works in order for that trust to already be established. We can't start that process going in blind. We need to build up that relationship, and that is what honesty allows us to do, allows us to build something that we weren't actually able to do in the past. So let's go zoom back out with the time that we have remaining, and let's try to build a test for dishonest software. The test that we were applying before was, does this software break the law? Or, and the answer was no. But we know what we were doing led to a, dis, led to a bad outcome. We were dishonest. So what's a good test for dishonest software? Does the introduction of informed consent break the software's value proposition? If you ask someone and you tell them directly what they're doing and they have to opt into it, does the software no longer do its thing because it just doesn't function properly anymore? I'm going to talk about a company that's a real company. I'm going to reveal their name. You guys might be using it today. That's OK. I think it's a good example of what we're talking about. There's a company out there called Full Story. They do pixel perfect session replay. It's a little JavaScript widget that you put on your web app, your website, and it is like a flight recorder for every single thing that the individual user is doing. I put together like a little animated GIF here. This is their UI. Here's some people that didn't convert. These are all the sessions, and you can actually click play, and then you see exactly what they do. You can see their mouse movements. You can see where they were clicking, even if that click didn't amount to anything. You can watch it like you're watching a movie. It's wild. It's really useful if uh, you're into UX. Feels kind of weird, though. In fact, a lot of people felt that way. Nike used Full Story, and they are now the subject of a class action lawsuit for recording screen sessions of their website visitors. Sure, there was a little bit of information in the privacy policy that they were doing this, but according to the complaint, you know, the, the, uh, the 
the complainants felt that this was really wiretapping and that they were being secretly observed and that they would be, Nike would be able to glean information like PII in a position where they shouldn't have access to it. Shocker, like, oh my gosh, how could this happen to us? But it's really, how, how, if you look at this honestly and, and really think about what you're doing, of course this is how people would feel if they found out, but they should have already known, right? This is how Full Story actually talks about this. Do I actually need to inform my users that their behavior is being logged? And at the end of the day, their response is, we just build the tool. It's kind of up to you to make sure it's not illegal. That, we feel, is a dishonest approach. It's kind of cliche to talk about Steve Jobs, but one of the things that he did right before he died is he attended this uh, uh, tech conference for all things D called D8. Uh, they're talking about the iPad, like the removal of not going into Flash. It's kind of like funny to look back in time, like the things that people were concerned about. But there was a little bit of a, a, a discussion about privacy. And he came up with, I think, a really quick thing off the cuff that ended up being, I think, really prescient, which is, you know, people are smart. And when you ask them for sensitive data, you need to ask them. You need to ask them every time. You need to make them tell you to stop asking you. And you then need to tell them exactly what you're going to be doing with that data and what the benefit is. And we could see this, you know, uh, this, this feeling that he had actually permeated Apple even after his death. And now all of us have been subjected to things that look like this. Um, we've probably had dozens of these that we've had since the iOS 14 update earlier this year or l late last year. And I imagine many of us have clicked Ask App Not to Track. And this is hurting the ad industry right now. Facebook's earnings were in the toilet, and they've primarily blamed revenue headwinds caused by Apple. This is the reason why. So what is the anatomy of informed consent? What can we bring to our software today? Well, here's some examples from Collide. The first thing is we want to ask in plain English, or the native language of the, of the user, and then we want to require a response. So in our case, that looks like this. In Collide, there's a feature called Lost Mode where an administrator can find the geolocation of a device. As I said earlier, that's not illegal. We don't have to ask anyone's permission to do that. But Collide does. And as soon as the, the administrator wants to do that, perhaps the device is lost, the end user on any other device that they're using via Slack, a place where they are at, by the way, they're not downloading another thing it's not buried in a document. It's on Slack. We explain why, what the, person, what the administrator will be able to see and do, and then they have to click a button. That's step one. Step two is once they say yes, you have to let them see the data that you've collected. You have to give them access to it, and it has to be by default. You can't require them to ask another person to see it. They just need to be able to see it. So as soon as the device starts recording geolocation data and sending it back to Collide, we show it to the user. We show them what the, the administrator can see, where the pin is on the map, and that way you know exactly what data is being collected and how it was visualized, augmented, and decorated. Finally, is you need to allow them to revoke consent at any time without talking to a person automatically in the place that they are at where they will be able to do that. And it doesn't matter if the administrator doesn't want that to happen. They, they, that's the beauty of informed consent is that you are allowed to revoke it at any time. So in our case, right in Slack, there's a little drop down menu and they can just click turn off loss mode and then boom, it's off. They don't have to ask permission. It's just off as soon as they express the intent that they want that to happen. That is informed consent. If your product wouldn't work anymore with that type of workflow, there are dishonest properties to that product. All right, so we're getting close to the end, and I want to talk about your role, everybody in this room. I'm really glad that you're here because this is something that we are now entering, I think, an era of privacy consciousness that we haven't had in the, this country specifically, I think globally, in a long time. It's allowed companies like Collide to gain a really strong footing against, I think, dishonest incumbents in these types of industries. 
And it's your job to recognize the fact that everybody in this room is likely a developer and you have more power than you think, especially right now. We're hiring at Collide. I can't tell you how hard it is to find uh, Ruby engineers to join us and the salaries that you, know, you folks are commanding. And you have the ability to actually make change in the organizations that you work for. This is really important because you all have something like special. You have technical knowledge that you can apply and independently analyze the honesty or dishonesty of, of, of software that is thrust upon you, but more importantly, your family, your fellow coworkers, your peers, your friends. And they don't necessarily have that same level of knowledge. And so one thing that often happens is that you'll hear a big announcement at your company, like, we're rolling this out. It's uh, you know, the new CrowdStrike Secure, whatever, Falcon DX3. And it's going to help us defend against the APT. And, that's, and we're growing up, we're being a real company. There's always developers out there that understand really what this means under the hood. And they advocate for themselves and they say, I don't want this. I want to be the exception. Don't just advocate for yourself. Advocate for everyone around you, the folks that don't understand what that product is really capable of doing. Here are the arguments that you can deploy. And both you know, IT security teams thrusting this type of software on you or you being forced in a position to build dishonest software. The first is that building honest software is now a competitive advantage. We've seen tons of applications that really bring to light, I think, a lot of the dishonest nature of, of the world that we live in. Hey.com is a great example by DHH. They have the little um, binoculars that show like when there's pixel trackers in the email, what we've been doing at Collide, the extensions out there that really help you block some of the stuff. There's money to be made here. There's a capitalistic argument to do this. Dishonest security, like the dishonest software is really at the end of the road. There are increasingly more prolific privacy laws, especially in the European Union, GDPR. You can't sell the, the type of software that you could you used to be able to sell before, and it's better to prepare now be, instead of being caught flat-footed. And more importantly, device vendors like Apple, their whole ability to do well is based on people trusting that their information on their device is going to be in their control. So they are going to work very, very hard to force anyone who's an application developer to be honest. So you, if you can adapt these types of principles now, you don't have to have them dictate it for you through a new iOS update. You can prepare. And I often find that organizations that justify building dishonest software can justify all sorts of things. Maybe being dishonest with employees, being dishonest in you know, their dealings with customers, it becomes infectious. And if you can nip it at the bud and create a culture of honesty and transparency in your organization for the software that you're building, it will permeate to every other thing that you do. And it's worth it. And with that, I thank you. And I appreciate that everybody's here. And uh, go forth and try to do your best to be as honest as possible. Great. Um, for the folks who came in as I started, we have Collide swag in the front, t-shirts, things like that. Feel free to grab it on your way out. I have a minute for questions. I can maybe take one question or, 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 or two questions if anybody has any. Yeah, so the question was, how do I feel about losing access to something if I'm not providing my information in return? I think there's two ways to really think about that. There's the B2C case as a consumer. Am I should I get the benefit of the social network if I'm not, be, I'm not willing to share my information with advertiser data? I think that that's a fair contract to make. If something like, someone like Facebook said, we don't want you on our social network because we can't make money off of you if you don't share your data with us, that's, I think, a clear business transaction. As long as you have conformed consent, I think that that is an honest approach. In the same way that like, Bonnie and Clyde were honest about all the bank robberies and murders that they did, it's honest still, but you may not, it may not be for you. When it comes to forced, you know, your employment being really hinged on you submitting to a lot of these things, I think that change is in the air, and I think that you know, workers should be in a position where they might be able to organize against those types of tactics. I think that that's a very common thing that employers say, well, look, it's our way or the highway. This is an at-will state. 
you know, you, you know, you're really here at our pleasure, I think that's where grouping together and really pushing back at a fundamental level is, is the key to, to really supporting each other. And that requires people to work together, not individuals, because an individual can't necessarily mount that type of defense on their own. You're welcome. Any other questions? We've got time for one more, maybe. All right, thank you so much. Enjoy the last keynote.